1991, and that stupid Robin Hood song has been at number one in the UK forever. Fortunately, on the bright side, a computer CD revolution is about to enter the living room of everyone's home. Or at least that was what both Commodore and Philips' plan was. That plan may not have worked out as they hoped, but it was the plan. You could easily be forgiven for being into the whole retro thing, and yet never having heard of either CDTV or CDI. Commercially, they were not even success adjacent. Not quite Jaguar levels of failure, but it, but it did not go well. <laughs> What's that smell? Uh oh, comment section's on fire. Oh, oh, oh calm down, Jaguar. Just, just, just a joke. In hindsight, we can tell why neither CDI or CDTV did well. They were both aiming for a market that was never really there. Both were trying to introduce a new device into the living room to sit under the TV next to your video recorder. The interactive CD media device. It would be an encyclopedia, a source of education and entertainment. In the case of CDI, it would be something we could even watch video CDs on, assuming we buy a quite pricey add-on card. Philips were the first to start the process of creating their device, which is not odd considering that with Sony, they invented the audio CD. Philips had been working on the Doomsday Project with Acorn, and had created a method of getting data a computer could read encoded onto a laserdisc. Having developed that technology, Philips applied it to the CD and created CD-ROM. Now some of you may be thinking, I thought CDs were digital, so why can the computer just read the ones and zeros off that? And the answer to that question is error correction. If you simply just took the approach of reading the pits and lands as ones and zeros in a CD, a small bit of dust, slight scratch, would render the entire disc basically unreadable. So you need an error correction scheme, and that's what Philips developed with Laserdisc, and then transferred to CD. At a time when most people's hard disks were 100 meg or less, and all software came on floppy disks that maxed out at about 1.4 meg, a CD with its 160 meg of storage was huge. Philips had a vision of us all having complete encyclopedias on CD, interactive telephone books and yellow pages. Yeah, young people ask your parents about what that is. And basically a wide range of large data sets and applications and some games. Now it's not surprising that Philips envisaged this whole new world based on just being able to have, well, more storage. As many applications were limited essentially by the size of storage available to them. You could only distribute so much data. This was opening up a whole new world for them. Also, with Philips having been involved in Doomsday, they'd seen what an interactive reference work could be like. Philips envisioned this device as something different to a home computer or a games console. It was something the whole family could use. It would sit under the big TV in the living room with the whole family gathered around, learning about, I don't know, history and stuff. Philips were not the only people to think that this was a good idea. Commodore also thought it was a good idea. So, after hearing about CDI, they took an Amiga 500, slapped the CD-ROM drive on in there, shoved it in a case that resembled a VCR, and beat Philips to market. I bet that went down well with Philips. When CDI came out, Philips put quite a bit of marketing spend behind it, with both TV and print ads. CDI also managed to attract a certain amount of coverage in the news media as well. Commodore followed its usual marketing strategy for all things Amiga, and tried to avoid telling anyone of the existence of the product whatsoever. Okay, I exaggerate a little bit, but not by as much as you would hope if you had shares in Commodore. Right, let's get a look at these machines, starting with the CDI. Now you can see it's very much going for a VCR kind of a look. This is because they intended you to pop it under the big TV in the living room, and think of it more as a living room kind of device, and not so much a games console or computer. It's based around Philips' own 68070 CPU, which is basically a 68000 with some extra built-in hardware and some performance issues, although Philips compensated for that by ramping up the clock speed a fair amount on it. Graphics-wise, it had a palette of 16.7 million colours, with 32,000 of them available on screen at any one time. On the sound front, it had an 8-bit sound chip, with the ability to stream 16-bit audio from the CD. If we look round the back, we can see the MPEG-1 add-on decoder, which allowed it to play CDI movies and full motion video games. The controller for the CDI from a gaming standpoint was awful, I mean, just awful. It's ergonomically bad, it uses infrared like your TV remote, so it's unresponsive at the moment, button presses get missed. It's, it's bad. To be honest, it's even worse than the Jaguar controller. Well, except it doesn't give you RSI. Now, let's have a look at the CDTV. Again, this thing looks like a VCR, only it is an Amiga 500. I mean, it may not come with a keyboard and a mouse, but it is an Amiga with a CD drive. You could even get the keyboard and mouse and floppy drive as an add-on, so you could play regular Amiga games and, you know, 
do a bit of word processing on it. So, spec-wise, it's the same as the Amiga 500. It has a Motorola 68000 CPU and the full Amiga custom chipset. Things like the TV modulator are built directly into it, and it also has the Amiga 500 display port as well, so you can plug in a monitor, or a rather posh TV using the separate red, green and blue signals the port could produce. CDs were loaded into the CDTV using caddies. Now if you were not around for when caddies was a thing and you're thinking, that looks needlessly awkward, yeah you'd be right. I have absolutely nothing to say to commend them. Not, not, not a single thing. If you're wondering if this whole caddy mess was a uniquely Commodore thing, no, sadly not. Caddy loading CD drives were pretty common on most platforms in the early times of CD-ROM. God alone knows why. I mean, CDs, they're hard to break, they're hard to damage, so let's wrap them in a small plastic box that is easy to break and easy to damage, and the door just snaps off all the damn time, and if you drop it, a small spring explodes across the room, rendering the whole caddy completely effing useless. Oh yeah, and if you broke your caddy, a replacement caddy costs nearly about the same amount as a game. Yeah, caddies were awful. And if you're wondering, did we just use caddies because it took us a while to invent CD trays? Nope, CD tray based CD ROM drives came out the same time as the caddy based ones. Ah! Right, back to the whole CD TV thing. Well, as mentioned, CDI's controller was basically awful, and if you think Commodore was going to produce a really good one, no, no, they made this. Yep, drink it in. Okay, it's not as bad as the CDI one. I mean, it is at least comfortable to hold in two hands. You know, it's kind of got a D-pad thing going on, but it's also infrared, so it also misses key presses and stuff, and as the batteries go flat, it gets worse. Yeah, it's still an awful, awful controller, but just not as awful as the CDI one. Thank God you can just plug an Amiga joystick into this thing and then, you know, enjoy playing a game. Software-wise, CDTV got a number of reference works, as did CDI. The CDTV also got a lot of shovelware from the A500, which was basically just the floppy disk version on a CD. But some standout games did make use of the CD, uh, Defender of the Crown being one that people often tend to point out. CDI got a fair few ported games, as well as a few originals of its own. Some of those originals were even based on Nintendo IP, in the form of Hotel Mario, Zelda Wand of Gamelon, and Link Faces of Evil, and of course, Zelda's Adventure. Sales of both CDI and CDTV were not going well, and both companies took a different approach to this. Commodore decided to cut its losses and stop making CDTV. They sold off the remaining rather large inventory by marketing it as an A500 with a CD-ROM drive, and added in a black keyboard, mouse and floppy drive, and sold it as a bundle. In this form, CDTV sold quite well until they ran out of stock. Commodore then went on to make a CD add-on for the A500, called the A570, which you can see here. Ooh and they finally released it just in time to halt production of the A500. As newer Amigas had been released, and these newer Amigas, yeah, they didn't have a CD add-on, so you ended up with the odd situation where you could buy a CD add-on for a machine that you could no longer purchase. Very 90s Commodore. Philips, who were really heavily invested in CDI, decided to take a different tack and kept ploughing on. They decided to pivot a little bit and make out that CDI was more of a games console. This is their updated version, the CDI 450. As you can see, it's now much more like a traditional games console, but relatively little else has changed about the hardware. It is, however, cheaper for Philips to make, so the price managed to drop a little bit, and they got rid of the absolutely terrible controller and replaced it with a moderately alright one, actually. It's kind of shaped like a gamepad, like on most other systems, and it uses a cable rather than the whole infrared thing, which was, you know, quite an improvement. Hardware rise, the CDI would struggle somewhat to compete with other popular consoles of the time, so they decided to lean heavily into the full motion video game craze that was happening. Now this did mean that a lot of games depended on the optional MPEG-1 decoder board, which was a bit of a problem. However, for the time, CDI really did do full motion games quite well compared to other systems. It's just that, you know, full motion video games were kind of, well, awful. Probably one of the reasons Philips stuck it out with CDI was that they were not the only manufacturer of CDI systems. Philips had created CDI as a standard that they could license out to other manufacturers, and they brought on board a fair few, like LG, Grundig and Sony. Sony had even gone so far as to make a handheld CDI with built-in LCD screen. You know, that thing must have sold in the tens. Eventually, after eight years in production, Philips decided to call time on CDI, and they never released a follow-up console. 
However, the business model that Philips created of create a platform and then license it out to third parties to make their own units was used again by 3DO, and they did not make a success of it either. Now, for a video referencing two machines, you might expect me to do some form of one versus the other type comparison. Well, I'm going to subvert expectations and not. CDI definitely outsold CDTV, but whether one's better than the other kind of depends on what you want to get out of the thing, especially as a retro collector. I mean, if you're a big fan of the Amiga and what you want is an Amiga 500 with a CD drive that fits under your TV, CDTV's a pretty good way to go. Now, admittedly, if you're one of those collectors, you're more likely to want a CD32 because that gives you an Amiga 1200 that you can stick under a TV with a CD drive that, you know, looks a bit more like a games console. But CDTV is still not a bad buy. If you're not someone who's already into Amigas, it's probably not the first machine to start with from the Amiga line. I mean, there are much cheaper options out there. I mean, an A500 costs a fraction of what a CDTV is going to cost you. Even a 1200. Yeah, it's still going to be cheaper than a CDTV. Now, CDI on the other hand, well, there's no one game on it I'd actually recommend that, ooh, you have to play that. It's got a few games that are fine. Um, it's got some that are okay. It's got a lot that are truly awful, but nothing where I go, ooh, you definitely must play that. That being said, though, if you're a Mario fan who has to have every single Mario game there is, then CDTV's definitely got a Mario game that you may want in your collection. Um, same with Link, same with Zelda. Also, you know, if you're sufficiently sadomasochistic enough to be really into full motion video games, then CDI's got some pretty competent implementation of early 90s, mid 90s full motion video games. I mean, yeah, they're still the same games that were available for every other platform, but CDI is a convenient way to run them, you know, one box, plug it into your TV, put in a disc, away you go. There isn't configuring about 50 drivers and trying to emulate a real magic video card and all the other messing around you have to go for on a couple of other platforms. If you are going to buy a CDI for full motion video games though, I would recommend that you get one with the MPEG decoder card or find an MPEG decoder card somewhere because a lot of these games really do need it. Also, if you're a fan of light gun games, CDI's got a few, and more importantly, it's got a light gun that actually works on modern TVs, as it has a little receiver box and doesn't rely on the beam scanning of the CRT. If you are into your light gun games, I'll just give a quick shout out to a YouTube channel called Ghoulfish on Games. He's done a whole bunch of really interesting videos on them. I'll drop a link to his channel in the description below. Well, that about wraps it up for this video. If you've made it all the way to the end, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time, as apparently so does YouTube's ranking algorithms. If you enjoyed it, why not pop a comment in the section below, tell us about your experiences via the CDTV or CDI. And if you liked it sufficiently, you can share it with other people that you like too. And if you didn't like the video, well, you can share it with people that you hate. Also, my thanks go out to the fabulous Mr. Zombie Workshop, who once again lends his art skills to this episode. And also the equally wonderful Mr. Johnny Blanchard, who was kind enough to lend us a little bit of CDI footage, as someone broke their upscaler. Yeah, it, it was me. And if you're feeling in the mood to click a subscribe button, please do, it really helps out small channels like this one.